The Raja's Emerald by Agatha Christie With a serious effort, James Bond bent his attention once more on the little yellow book in his hand. On its outside, the book bore the simple but pleasing legend, Do you want your salary increased by three hundred pounds per annum? Its price was one shilling. James had just finished reading two pages of crisp paragraphs instructing him to look his boss in the face, to cultivate a dynamic personality, and to radiate an atmosphere of efficiency. He had now arrived at a subtler matter. There is a time for frankness, there is a time for discretion, the little yellow book informed him. A strong man does not always blurt out all he knows. James let the little book close, and raising his head, gazed out over a blue expanse of ocean. A horrible suspicion assailed him, that he was not a strong man. A strong man would have been in command of the present situation, not a victim to it. For the sixtieth time that morning, James rehearsed his wrongs. This was his holiday. His holiday? Ha! Huh. Sardonic laughter. Who had persuaded him to come to that fashionable seaside resort, Crimpton on Sea? Grace. Who had urged him into an expenditure of more than he could afford? Grace. And he had fallen in with the plan eagerly. She had got him here. And what was the result? While he was staying in an obscure boarding house about a mile and a half from the sea front, Grace who should have been in a similar boarding house, not the same one, the proprietors of James's circle were very strict, had flagrantly deserted him, and was staying at no less than the Esplanade Hotel upon the sea front. It seemed that she had friends there. Friends! Again James laughed sardonically. His mind went back over the last three years of his leisurely courtship of grace. Extremely pleased she had been when he had first singled her out for notice. That was before she had risen to heights of glory in the millinery salon at Messrs. Bottles in the High Street. In those early days, it had been James who had gave himself airs. Now Alice, the boot was on the other leg. Grace was what is technically known as earning good money. It had made her uppish. Yes, that was it thoroughly uppish. A confused fragment out of a poetry book came back to James's mind, something about thanking heaven fasting for a good man's love. But there was nothing of that kind of thing observable about Grace. Well fed on an esplanade hotel breakfast, she was ignoring a good man's love utterly. She was indeed accepting the attentions of a poisonous idiot called Clob Sopworth, a man, James felt convinced, of no moral worth whatsoever. James ground a heel into the earth and scowled darkly at the horizon. Kimpton on sea. What had possessed him to come to such a place? It was preeminently a resort of the rich and fashionable. It possessed two large hotels and several miles of picturesque bungalows belonging to fashionable actresses rich Jews, and those members of the English aristocracy who had married wealthy wives. The rent, furnished, of the smallest bungalow was twenty-five guineas a week. Imagination boggled at what the rent of the large ones might amount to. There was one of those places immediately behind James's seat. It belonged to that famous sportsman, Lord Edward Campion, and they were staying there at the moment a houseful of distinguished guests, including the Raja of Maraputna, whose wealth was fabulous. James had read all about him in the local weekly newspaper that morning. The extent of his Indian possessions, his palaces, his wonderful collection of jewels, with a special mention of one famous emerald, which the papers declared enthusiastically was the size of a pigeon's egg. James, being town-bred, was somewhat hazy about the size of a pigeon's egg, but the impression left on his mind was good. If I had an emerald like that, 
said James, scowling at the horizon again. I'd show grace. The sentiment was vague, but the enunciation of it made James feel better. Laughing voices hailed him from behind, and he turned abruptly to confront Grace. With her was Clara Sopworth, Alice Sopworth, Dorothy Sopworth, and Alice, Claude Sopworth. The girls were arm in arm and giggling. Why, you are quite a stranger, cried Grace archly. Yes, said James. He could, he felt, have found a more telling retort. You cannot convey the impression of a dynamic personality by the use of the one word, yes. He looked with intense loathing at Claude Sopworth. Claude Sopworth was almost as beautifully dressed as the hero of a musical comedy. James longed passionately for the moment when an enthusiastic beach dog should plan wet, sandy forefeet on the unsullied whiteness of Claude's flannel trousers. He himself wore a serviceable pair of dark grey flannel trousers which had seen better days. Isn't the air beautiful? said Clara, sniffing it appreciatively. Quite sets you up, doesn't it? She giggled. It's ozone, said Alice Sopworth. It's as good as tonic, you know. And she giggled also. James thought, I should like to knock their silly heads together. What is the sense of laughing all the time? They are not saying anything funny. The immaculate Claude murmured languidly, Shall we have a bath, or is it too much of a fag? The idea of bathing was accepted shrilly. James fell into line with them. He even managed, with a certain amount of cunning, to draw Grace a little behind the others. Look here, he complained. I'm hardly seeing anything of you. Well, I'm sure we are all together now, said Grace and you can come and lunch with us at the hotel. At least... She looked dubiously at James's legs. What is the matter? demanded James ferociously. Not smart enough for you, I suppose? I do think, dear, you might take a little more pains, said Grace. Everyone is so fearfully smart here. Look at Claude Sopworth. I have looked at him said James grimly. I have never seen a man who looked a more complete ass than he does. Grace drew herself up. There is no need to criticize my friends, James. It's not manners. He's dressed just like any other gentleman at the hotel is dressed. Pah! said James. Do you know what I read the other day in society snippets? Why, that the Duke of... The Duke of... I can't remember, but one Duke, anyway, was the worst-dressed man in England. There. I dare say, said Grace. But then, you see, he's a Duke. Well? demanded James. What is wrong with my being a Duke some day? At least, well, not perhaps a Duke, but a peer. He slapped the little book in his pocket and recited to her a long list of peers of the realm who had started life much more obscurely than James Bond. Grace merely giggled. Don't be so soft, James, she said. Fancy you Earl of Kimpton on sea. James gazed at her in mingled rage and despair. The air of Kimpton on sea had certainly gone to Grace's head. The beach at Kimpton is a long, straight stretch of sand. A row of bathing huts and boxes stretched evenly along it for about a mile and a half. The party had just stopped before a row of six huts all labelled imposingly, for visitors to this planet hotel only. Here we are, said Grace brightly. But I'm afraid you can't come in with us, James. You will have to go along to the public tents over there. We'll meet you in the sea. So long. So long, said James, and he strode off in the direction indicated.
Twelve dilapidated tents stood solemnly confronting the ocean. An aged mariner guarded them, a roll of blue paper in his hand. He accepted a coin of the realm from James, tore him off a blue ticket from his robe, threw him over a towel, and jerked one thumb over his shoulder. "'Take your turn,' he said huskily. It was then that James awoke to the fact of competition. Others besides himself had conceived the idea of entering the sea. Not only was each tent occupied, but outside each tent was a determined-looking crowd of people glaring at each other. James attached himself to the smallest group and waited. The strings of the tent parted, and a beautiful young woman, sparsely clad, emerged on the scene, settling her bathing cap with the air of one who had the whole morning to waste. She strolled down to the water's edge and sat down dreamily on the sands. "'That's no good,' said James to himself, and attached himself forthwith to another group. After waiting five minutes, sounds of activity were apparent in the second tent. With heavings and strainings, the flaps parted asunder, and four children and a father and mother emerged. The tent being so small, it had something of the appearance of a conjuring trick. On the instant, two women sprang forward, each grasping one flap of the tent. "'Excuse me,' said the first young woman, panting a little. "'Excuse me,' said the other young woman, glaring. "'I would have you know I was here quite ten minutes before you were,' said the first young woman rapidly. "'I have been here a good quarter of an hour, as anyone will tell you,' said the second young woman defiantly. "'Now then, now then,' said the aged marina, drawing near. Both young women spoke to him shrilly. When they had finished, he jerked his thumb at the second young woman and said briefly, "'It's yours.' Then he departed, deaf to remonstrances. He neither knew nor cared which had been there first, but his decision— as they say in newspaper competitions, was final. The despairing James caught at his arm. Look here, I say. Well, mister, how long is it going to be before I get a tent? The aged marina threw a dispassionate glance over the waiting throng. Might be an hour, might be an hour and a half. I can't say. At that moment, James espied Grace and the sopward girls running lightly down the sands towards the sea. Damn, said James to himself. Oh, damn. He plucked once more at the aged marina. Can't I get a tent anywhere else? What about one of these huts along here? They all seem empty. The huts, said the ancient marina with dignity, a private. Having uttered this rebuke, he passed on. With a bitter feeling of having been tricked, James detached himself from the waiting groups and strode savagely down the beach. It was the limit. It was the absolute, complete limit. He glared savagely at the trim bathing boxes he passed. In that moment, from being an independent liberal, he became a red-hot socialist. Why should the rich have bathing boxes and be able to bathe any minute they chose without waiting in a crowd? This system of ours, said James vaguely, is all wrong. From the sea came the coquettish screams of the splashed. Grace's voice! And above her squeaks, the inane laughter of Claude Sopworth. Damn! said James, grinding his teeth, a thing which he had never before attempted, only read about in works of fiction. He came to a stop, twirling his stick savagely and turning his back firmly on the sea. Instead, he gazed with concentrated hatred upon Eagle's Nest, Buena Vista, and Mont Desir. It was the custom of the inhabitants of Kimpton on Sea to label their bathing huts with fancy names. Eagle's Nest merely struck James as being silly, 
and Buena Vista was beyond his linguistic accomplishments. But his knowledge of French was sufficient to make him realize the oppositeness of the third name. Mon desire, said James. I should jolly well think it was. And on that moment he saw that while the doors of the other bathing huts were tightly closed, that of Mon desire was ajar. James looked thoughtfully up and down the beach. This particular spot was mainly occupied by mothers of large families, busily engaged in superintending their offspring. It was only ten o'clock, too early as yet for the aristocracy of Crunton and Sea to have come down to bathe. Eating quails and mushrooms in their beds as likely as not, brought to them on trays by powdered footmen. Not one of them will be down here before twelve o'clock, thought James. He looked again towards the sea. With the obedience of a well-trained leitmotif, the shrill scream of grace rose upon the air. It was followed by the laughter of Claude Sopworth. I will, said James between his teeth. He pushed open the door of Mondesir and entered. For the moment he had a fright, as he caught sight of sundry garments hanging from pegs, but he was quickly reassured. The hut was partitioned into two. On the right-hand side, a girl's yellow sweater, a battered Panama hat, and a pair of bead shoes were depending from a peg. On the left-hand side, an old pair of grey flannel trousers, a pullover, and a sole wester proclaimed the fact that the sexes were segregated. James hastily transferred himself to the gentleman's part of the hut, and undressed rapidly. Three minutes later, he was in the sea puffing and snorting importantly, doing extremely short bursts of professional-looking swimming, head under the water, arms lashing the sea, that style. "'Oh, there you are!' cried Grace. "'I was afraid you wouldn't be in for ages with all that crowd of people waiting there.' Really? said James. He thought with affectionate loyalty of the yellow book. The strong man can on occasions be discreet. For the moment his temper was quite restored. He was able to say pleasantly but firmly to Claude Sopworth, who was teaching Grace the overarm stroke. No, no, old man, you have got it all wrong. I'll show her and such was the assurance of his tone that Claude withdrew discomfited. The only pity of it was that his triumph was short-lived. The temperatures of our English waters is not such as to induce bathers to remain in them for any length of time. Grace and the Sopwood girls were already displaying blue chins and chattering teeth. They raced up the beach, and James pursued his solitary way back to Mondesir. As he toweled himself vigorously and slipped his shirt over his head, he was pleased with himself. He had, he felt, displayed a dynamic personality. And then, suddenly he stood still, frozen with terror. Girlish voices sounding from outside, and voices quite different from those of Grace and her friends. A moment later he had realized the truth. The rightful owners of Mondesi were arriving. It is possible that if James had been fully dressed, he would have waited their advent in a dignified manner, and attempted an explanation. As it was, he acted on panic. The windows of Mondesi were modestly screened by dark green curtains. James flung himself on the door and held the knob in a desperate clutch. Hans tried ineffectually to turn it from outside. "'It's locked, after all,' said a girl's voice. "'I thought Peg said it was open.' "'No, Woggle said so.' "'Woggle is the limit,' said the other girl. "'How perfectly foul! We shall have to go back for the key.' James heard their footsteps retreating. He drew a long, deep breath. In desperate haste, he huddled on the rest of his garments. Two minutes later saw him strolling negligently down the beach with an almost aggressive air of innocence. 
Grace and the Sopwith girls joined him on the beach a quarter of an hour later. The rest of the morning passed agreeably in stone throwing, writing in the sand, and light bantinage. Then Claude glanced at his watch. Lunch time, he observed. We'd better be strolling back. I'm terribly hungry, said Alice Sopwith. All the other girls said that they were terribly hungry too. Are you coming, James? asked Grace. Doubtless, James was unduly touchy. He chose to take offence at her tone. Not if my clothes are not good enough for you, he said bitterly. Perhaps, as you are so particular, I'd better not come. That was Grace's cue for murmured protestations. But the seaside air had affected Grace unfavourably. She merely replied, Very well. Just as you like. See you this afternoon, then. James was left dumbfounded. Well, he said, staring after the retreating group. Well, of all the... He strolled moodily into the town. There were two cafes in Kimpton-on-Sea. They are both hot, noisy, and overcrowded. It was the affair of the bathing huts once more. James had to wait his turn. He had to wait longer than his turn. An unscrupulous matron who had just arrived forestalling him when a vacant seat did present itself. At last he was seated at a small table. Close to his left ear, three raggedly bobbed maidens were making a determined hash of Italian opera. Fortunately, James was not musical. He studied the bill of fare dispassionately, his hands thrust deep into his pockets. He thought to himself, Whatever I ask for, it's sure to be off. That's the kind of fellow I am. His right hand, groping in the recesses of his pocket, touched an unfamiliar object. It felt like a pebble, a large round pebble. What on earth did I put a stone in my pocket for? thought James. His fingers closed round it. A waitress drifted up to him. Fried place and chipped potatoes, please, said James. Fried place is off, murmured the waitress, her eyes fixed dreamily on the ceiling. Then I'll have curried beef, said James. Curried beef is off. Is there anything on this beastly menu that isn't off? demanded James. The waitress looked pained and placed a pale grey forefinger against haricot mutton. James resigned himself to the inevitable and ordered haricot mutton. His mind still seething with resentment against the ways of cafes, he drew his hand out of his pocket, the stone still in it. Unclosing his fingers, he looked absent-mindedly at the object in his palm. Then, with a shock, all lesser matters passed from his mind, and he stared with all his eyes. The thing he held was not a pebble. It was, he could hardly doubt it, an emerald, an enormous green emerald. James stared at it, horror-stricken. No, it couldn't be an emerald. It must be coloured glass. There couldn't be an emerald of that size, unless... Printed words danced before James's eyes. The Raja of Maraputna, famous emerald the size of a pigeon's egg. Was it? Could it be? That emerald at which he was now looking? The waitress returned with the haricot mutton and James closed his fingers spasmodically. Hot and cold shivers chased themselves up and down his spine. He had the sense of being caught in a terrible dilemma. If this was the emerald, but was it? Could it be? He unclosed his fingers and peeped anxiously. James was no expert on precious stones, but the depth and the glow of the jewel convinced him this was the real thing. He put both elbows on the table and leaned forward, staring with unseeing eyes at the haricot mutton, slowly congealing on the dish in front of him.
he had got to think this out. If this was the Rajah's emerald, what was he going to do about it? The word police flashed into his mind. If you found anything of value, you took it to the police station. Upon this axiom had James been brought up. Yes, but how on earth had the emerald got into his treasure pocket? That was doubtless the question the police would ask. It was an awkward question, and it was moreover a question to which he had at the moment no answer. How had the emerald got into his treasure pocket? He looked despairingly down at his legs, and as he did so, a misgiving shot through him. He looked more closely. One pair of old grey flannel trousers is very much like another pair of old grey flannel trousers, but all the same, James had an instinctive feeling that these were not his trousers after all. He sat back in his chair, stunned with the force of the discovery. He saw now what had happened. In the hurry of getting out of the bathing hut, he had taken the wrong trousers. He had hung his own, he remembered, on an adjacent peg to the old pair hanging there. Yes, that explained matters so far. He had taken the wrong trousers. But all the same, what on earth was an emerald worth hundreds and thousands of pounds doing there? The more he thought about it, the more curious it seemed. He could, of course, explain to the police. It was awkward, no doubt about it. It was decidedly awkward. One would have to mention the fact that one had deliberately entered someone else's bathing hut. It was not, of course, a serious offence, but it started him off wrong. Can I bring you anything else, sir? It was the waitress again. She was looking pointedly at the untouched haricot mutton. James hastily dumped some of it on his plate and asked for his bill. Having obtained it, he paid and went out. As he stood undecidedly in the street, a poster opposite caught his eye. The adjacent town of Harchester possessed an evening paper, and it was the contents bill of this paper that James was looking at. It announced a simple, sensational fact. The Rajah's Emerald Stolen My God, said James faintly, and leaned against a pillar. Pulling himself together, he fished out a penny and purchased a copy of the paper. He was not long in finding what he sought. Sensational items of local news were few and far between. Large headlines adorned the front page. Sensational burglary at Lord Edward Campion's. Theft of famous historical emerald. Raja of Maraputna's terrible loss. The facts were few and simple. Lord Edward Campion had entertained several friends the evening before. Wishing to show the stone to one of the ladies present, the Raja had gone to fetch it and had found it missing. The police had been called in. So far, no clue had been obtained. James let the paper fall to the ground. It was still not clear to him how the emerald had come to be reposing in the pocket of an old pair of flannel trousers in a bathing hut, but it was borne in upon him every minute that the police would certainly regard his own story as suspicious. What on earth was he to do? Here he was, standing in the principal street of Kempton-on-Sea with stolen booty worth a king's ransom reposingly idly in his pocket, while the entire police force of the district were busily searching for just that same booty. There were two courses open to him. Course number one, to go straight to the police station and tell his story. But it must be admitted that James funked that course badly. Course number two, somehow or other to get rid of the emerald. It occurred to him to do it up in a little neat parcel and post it back to the Raja. Then he shook his head. He had read too many detective stories for that sort of thing. He knew how you super sleuth could get busy with a magnifying glass and every kind of patent device. Any detective worth his salt would get busy on James's parcel and would in half an hour or so have discovered the sender's profession, age, 
habits and personal appearance. After that, it would be a mere matter of hours before he was tracked down. It was then that a scheme of dazzling simplicity suggested itself to James. It was the luncheon hour. The beach would be comparatively deserted. He would return to Mont Désir, hang up the trousers where he had found them, and regain his own garments. He started briskly towards the beach. Nevertheless, his conscience pricked him slightly. The emerald ought to be returned to the Raja. He conceived the idea that he might perhaps do a little detective work, once that is, that he had regained his own trousers and replaced the others. In pursuance of this idea, he directed his steps towards the aged marina, whom he rightly regarded as being an exhaustible source of Kimpton information. Excuse me, said James politely, but I believe a friend of mine has a hut on this beach, Mr. Charles Lambton. It is called Mondesir, I fancy. The aged marino was sitting very squarely in a chair, a pipe in his mouth, gazing out to sea. He shifted his pipe a little and replied without removing his gaze from the horizon. Mon Désir belongs to his lordship, Lord Edward Campion. Everyone knows that. I never heard of Mr. Charles Lambton. He must be a newcomer. Thank you, said James, and withdrew. The information staggered him. Surely the Raja could not himself have slipped the stone into the pocket and forgotten it. James shook his head. The theory did not satisfy him. But evidently, some member of the house party must be the thief. The situation reminded James of some of his favourite works of fiction. Nevertheless, his own purpose remained unaltered. All fell out easily enough. The beach was, as he hoped it would be, practically deserted. More fortunate still, the door of Mont Désir remained ajar. To slip in was the work of a moment. Edward was just lifting his own trousers from the hook when a voice behind him made him spin round suddenly. So I have caught you, my man, said the voice. James stared open mouthed. In the doorway of Mont Désir stood a stranger, a well-dressed man of about forty years of age, his face keen and hawk-like. So I have caught you, the stranger repeated. Who? Who are you? stammered James. Detective Inspector Marilis from the yard, said the other crisply, and I will trouble you to hand over that emerald. The... the emerald? James was seeking to gain time. That's what I said, didn't I? said Inspector Marilis. He had a crisp, business-like enunciation. James tried to pull himself together. I don't know what you are talking about, he said with an assumption of dignity. Oh yes, my lad, I think you do. The whole thing, said James, is a mistake. I can explain it quite easily. He paused. A look of weariness had settled on the face of the other. They always say that, murmured the Scotland Yard man dryly. I suppose you picked it up as you were strolling along the beach, eh? That is the sort of explanation. It did indeed bear a resemblance to it. James recognized the fact but he still tried to gain time. How do I know you are what you say you are? he demanded weakly. Merrilis flapped back his coat for a moment, showing a badge. Edward stared at him with eyes that popped out of his head. And now, said the other almost genially, you see what you're up against? You're a novice, I can tell that. Your first job, isn't it? James nodded. I thought as much. Now, my boy, are you going to hand over that emerald, or have I got to search you? James found his voice. I, 
I haven't got it on me, he declared. He was thinking desperately. Left it at your lodgings? queried Merrilis. James nodded. Very well, then, said the detective. We will go there together. He slipped his arm through James's. I'm taking no chances of your getting away from me, he said gently. We will go to your lodgings, and you will hand that stone over to me. James spoke unsteadily. If I do, will you let me go? he asked tremulously. Merrilis appeared embarrassed. We know just how that stone was taken, he explained, and about the lady involved, and of course, as far as that goes, well, the Raja wants it hushed up. You know what these native rulers are. James, who knew nothing whatsoever about native rulers, except for one cause celebre, nodded his head with an appearance of eager comprehension. It will be most irregular, of course, said the detective, but you may get off scot-free. Again James nodded. They had walked the length of the esplanade, and were now turning into the town. James intimated the direction, but the other man never relinquished his sharp grip on James's arm. Suddenly, James hesitated and half spoke. Merrilis looked up sharply, and then laughed. They were just passing the police station, and he noticed James's agonized glances at it. I am giving you a chance first, he said good humouredly. It was at that moment that things began to happen. A loud blow broke from James. He clutched the other's arms and yelled at the top of his voice, Help! Thief! Help! Thief! A crowd surrounded them in less than a minute. Merillis was trying to wrench his arm from James's grasp. I charge this man, cried James. I charge this man. He picked my pocket. What are you talking about, you fool? cried the other. A constable took charge of matters. Mr. Marillis and James were escorted into the police station. James reiterated his complaint. This man has just picked my pocket, he declared excitedly. He has got my note case in his right hand pocket. There! The man is mad, grumbled the other. You can look for yourself, Inspector, and see if he's telling the truth. At a sign from the Inspector, the constable slipped his hand deferentially into Merrily's pocket. He drew something out and held it up with a gasp of astonishment. My God, said the Inspector, startled out of professional decorum. It must be the Roger's Emerald. Merillis looked more incredulous than anyone else. This is monstrous, he spluttered. Monstrous! The man must have put it into my pocket himself as we were walking along together. It's a plant. The forceful personality of Merillis caused the inspector to waver. His suspicion swung round to James. He whispered something to the constable, and the latter went out. Now then, gentlemen, said the inspector, let me have your statements, please, one at a time. Certainly, said James. I was walking along the beach when I met this gentleman, and he pretended he was acquainted with me. I could not remember having him met him before, but I was too polite to say so. We walked along together. I had my suspicions of him, and just when we got opposite the police station, I found his hand in my pocket. I held on to him and shouted for help. The inspector transferred his glance to Marillis. And now you, sir. Marillis seemed a little embarrassed. The story is nearly very right, he said slowly. But not quite. It was not I who scraped acquaintance with him but he who scraped acquaintance with me. Doubtless he was trying to get rid of the emerald, and slipped it into my pocket while we were talking. 
The inspector stopped writing. Ha!、Huh, he said impartially. Well, there will be a gentleman here in a minute who will help us to get to the bottom of the case. Marilis frowned. It is really impossible for me to wait, he murmured, pulling out his watch. I have an appointment. Surely, Inspector, you can't be so ridiculous as to suppose I would steal the emerald and walk along with it in my pocket? It is not likely, sir. I agree, the inspector replied. But you will have to wait just a matter of five or ten minutes till we get this thing cleared up. Yeah, here is his lordship. A tall man of forty strode into the room. He was wearing a pair of dilapidated trousers and an old sweater. Now then, inspector, what is all this? he said. You have got hold of the emerald, you say? That's splendid. Very smart work. Who are these people you have got here? His eyes ranged over James and came to rest on Marilis. The forceful personality of the latter seemed to dwindle and shrink. Jones! exclaimed Lord Edward Campion. You recognize this man, Lord Edward? asked the inspector sharply. Certainly I do, said Lord Edward dryly. He is my valet. Came to me a month ago. The fellow they sent down from London was on to him at once, but there was not a trace of the emerald anywhere among his belongings. He was carrying it in his coat pocket, the inspector declared. This gentleman put us on to him. He indicated James. In another minute, James was being congratulated and shaken by the hand. My dear fellow, said Lord Edward Campion, so you suspected him all along, you say? Yes, said James. I had to trump up the story about my pocket being picked to get him into the police station. Well, it is splendid, said Lord Edward. Absolutely splendid. You must come back and lunch with us. That is, if you haven't lunched. It is late, I know, getting on for two o'clock. No, said James. I haven't lunched. But. Not a word, not a word, said Lord Edward. The Raja, you know, will want to thank you for getting back his emerald for him. Not that I have quite got the hang of the story yet. They were out of the police station by now. Standing on the steps. As a matter of fact, said James, I think I should like to tell you the true story. He did so. His lordship was very much entertained. Best thing I've ever heard in my life, he declared. I see it all now. Jones must have hurried down to the bathing hut as soon as he had pinched the thing, knowing that the police would make a thorough search of the house. That old pair of trousers I sometimes put on for going out fishing. Nobody was likely to touch them, and he could recover the jewel at his leisure. Must have been a shock to him when he came today to find it gone. As soon as you appeared, he realized that you were the person who had removed the stone. I still don't quite see how you managed to see through that detective pose of his, though. A strong man, thought James to himself. Knows when to be frank and when to be discreet. He smiled deprecatingly while his fingers passed gently over the inside of his coat lapel, feeling the small silver badge of that little known club, the Merton Park Super Cycling Club. An astonishing coincidence that the man Jones should also be a member. But there it was. Hello, James. He turned. Grace and the Sopwith girls were calling to him from the other side of the road. He turned to Lord Edward. Excuse me for a moment. He crossed the road to them. We are going to the pictures, said Grace. Thought you might like to come. I'm sorry, said James. I'm just going back to lunch with Lord Edward Campion. Yes, that man over there in the comfortable old clothes. He wants me to meet the Raja of Maraputna.
He raised his hat politely and rejoined Lord Edward. The End <laughs>